as I go into the latter half of my life, I didn't want to, again, have good cardio or, you know, be fit. I wanted to be strong. Mm. And the only thing that gets you strong is lifting heavy weights. Today's podcast, we have Andy Rutledge. Andy is uh, a new friend. He's just joined the company to help us with some creative work. So Andy is a copywriter. Um, I was interested in Andy's work as a copywriter because he's kind of our main target demo here, and he was a starting strength guy before he joined us, which is why him working with us appealed to me. He's a designer. He works on websites, apps, um, does a bunch of stuff in the creative field. And uh, he's an interesting character. And he, he's, he's quite judgmental of my eating habits, I should, I should tell you guys, because uh, he was talking some shit when I was bringing my own food through the airport because um, I've been copying Stan Efferdine. And you know what, Andy? I, I enjoy it, man. It's cheaper and it's, it's better. But, but before you respond to that, I, just, I bring it up because I wanted to let you know that I'm actually drinking um, about 30 ounces of skim milk, not full fat, skim milk, fair life. With um, I hope Ripito doesn't watch this. Two shots of decaf espresso. Are, are you even doing the program? <laughs> well, no, actually, I'm not. Uh, okay. Yeah, I've done the program. Now I'm doing some uh, some variation for people that have too many orthopedic injuries. Um, so loosely is the answer. Um, Andy, let's uh, let's start with your story. So the thing that's most interesting about you to me other than your skills at work, uh, are the fact that, uh, or is the fact that, uh, you've added what 55 pounds of body weight in your fifties. So let's just, let's just get that out of the way right away because right. I've, I've been uh, in the trenches battling the trolls on YouTube, these fucking 22 year old boys that don't understand anything about mm-hmm. anything that have the most firm opinions of any group of people in the world and lift weights, but don't actually understand how body weight works and how body composition works. So Andy, tell us about your, your weight gain situation, your, uh, your numbers, your overall story, if you don't mind. Okay. Thanks for having me on by, by the way, this, mm-hmm. uh, I hope this is uh, fun. I think it's going to be fun. Um, so yeah, I, uh, uh, I'm, as you can see, I'm uh, an elderly chap. So, uh, uh, at 54, I didn't like where my body was going. And I've been a, you know, an athlete most of my life, you know, soccer and karate and cycling and, and running and whatever. Uh, but, uh, I didn't like what I was seeing in the mirror and I was starting to, you know, to, you know, to head into the, the latter part of life. And so uh, I thought, you know, lifting is what I should do. And so started that. Uh, and started it, you know, crummy, you know, I had the, the one inch bar, the concrete filled plastic, you know, plates, that kind of stuff. And very quickly realized, you know, first of all, you can't put enough weight on the bar to do a lot of stuff very quickly. You run out of weight. So that was, uh, 2020 before, um, you know, COVID really shut down, uh, you know, availability on gym equipment and stuff like that. So I got ahead of that, I think, but, um, uh, got an Olympic bar, got started getting some plates and uh, started lifting for real. And I started a program that is similar to starting strength, uh, but, uh, you know, doesn't have the whole sort of oomph behind it. You know, all the 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 science and the experience and the, the sort of the comprehensive approach behind it. And the but there was this pink I'm man. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and th- I'm talking about... Um, like like a novice progression sure. yep. it did have five pounds per per workout mm-hmm. and so i started doing that um but there was like i said there was this pink man on youtube mm-hmm. that uh, was making a lot of sense <laughs> and uh and so uh and the folks that were around him seemed to be making a lot of sense i think this is before 
you kind of had a, a a really good sort of uh, video uh, media approach. And so I started consuming all that. And one of the things that continually came up was eating. And I realized, you know, I'm not doing that, at least the way they're talking about what they're talking about sounds outlandish. Hmm. But uh, it made sense to me. So I just started doing it, uh, you know, greatly increased. I never thought about what portion of my meals were protein and carbs and whatever. So I essentially just upped the protein and started uh, a bit and started gaining weight. And of course, at the beginning, I'm thinking, okay, I'm gaining weight. Am I just starting to get fat? <laughs> Am I putting on muscle? What's Because at first, you don't really notice a lot of stuff. But then a buddy of mine at lunch once, looked at me and he said, your traps are huge. What happened? Hmm. Cause I was literally this bean pole that was starting to get a bit of a little pot belly. Mm -hmm. And so things started changing. And so I kept, yeah, I mean, that was inspiring. So I just kept eating and kept lifting. And, and a couple of years later, um, now I have to turn sideways to get through a doorway, you know, <laughs> shoulders are just too wide. So. <laughs> Bean pole, yeah, and that's the uh, <clears throat> for all you old dogs listening. That's your trajectory if you're not lifting. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably lifting, but ultimately, uh, if you're a thin guy and you're aging and you don't put your body through the process of getting stronger, then it will get weaker because there's no there's no static state in nature. You're either improving or declining, and so muscular atrophy will find you. And uh, it'll start chipping away at you. And you can continue to keep your calories in check to avoid the pot belly. But if you're not as disciplined as that about that as, uh, as you would like to be, and you end up prioritizing the joy from food over your svelte bean pole stature, then uh, the pot belly is going to come. And so you'll be weak, you'll be skinny, and you'll be skinny fat at that. And that is not a good mm -hmm. trajectory. So... I've got a couple of follow-ups for you, Andy, but first hit us with your height and body weight, starting, starting body weight and current body weight. Okay. So I'm 5'10 and uh, started at around 170, 175 probably. Yeah, 175. And now I'm 230. Nice. And yeah. and for those listening, Andy just looks that, like that a whole... tub of lard. I mean, just, just – uh, He's hiding his multiple chins under his beard. Uh, he can hardly breathe. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And seriously, I didn't do anything special. Um, I didn't get on this sort of uh, having to weigh everything and measure everything and keep track of things in a book or whatever. I just, I, I looked at how many grams of protein I need and how many calories I need. And I kind of figured that out with some meal prep and some other stuff. But uh, I just ate and lifted and everything changed i seriously there, there are times still that i walk by a mirror and i'm like it's startling it's like that's not the guy that i've ever known my, in my whole life yep uh, the, the reason i invited you on the podcast the idea sprung from i forget who it was someone it might have been on the forum just reminded me that they love seeing the stories from older guys they love seeing the possibilities and um and i, I mean I think it's amazing that that the program could take a you know mid late twenties guy like me and um, add eighty pounds of useful body weight onto my frame and totally mm. change the trajectory of my life in every sense. Um, but you know I'm young and uh, <clears throat> that's not that surprising that that would work. But it's great. The fact that it works for a guy in his fifties and you can go from one seventy five to two thirty body weight. And um, not keel over from mm -hmm. a heart attack like everyone might expect, or be uh, this you know this sloppy mess of a human. Um, mm -hmm. This is not common knowledge. This is not common knowledge. No. It's not even necessarily common knowledge amongst the community. Um, and I got to tell you that when I'm when I'm coaching people in uh, in their fifties plus, I'm very cautious about the the pace of the weight gain because if I were to take a guy from one seventy mm -hmm. to two thirty. I'd want to make sure that that it's primarily lean body mass, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. and for a guy that's older, the testosterone situation is is usually compromised, and that means um, you got to be slow right. and steady, slower than you would otherwise, right? So, right, awesome, man, well done. What what yeah. were your what were your PRs so far? What are your PRs? Ah, uh, goodness, this is, 
part of it sounds good to me and part of it is, is really ridiculously awful. Um, my best squat single is 440. Hell yeah. Uh, deadlift. At uh, what age, real quick? 405. Uh, 57. So 57 years old. 440 at 57. From a skinny yeah. cyclist. That's when to, I started. To squatting 440. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I started, I think the, you know, when you when you're uneducated about things and you're just, and you got the enthusiasm about starting something, you, you try stuff. Yeah. And so I tried, I think the max squat that I was able to do was 160 for a single. Right, right, right. Do, do you guys understand what that means? What that does do a guy in his fifties who goes from 170 pounds squat to 440 pounds and goes from 170 pound body weight to 230 useful pounds. Explain, explain to us what that's done for you, Andy. A sorry, after you, after you finish the rest yeah. of your PRs, explain to us what that's done for you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, yeah, so what are you, squatting and deadlift and uh, bench? You know, I, I said I've been an athlete all my life. All of it's been lower body stuff. Mm -hmm. Never once did anything with arms or chest or back or anything. So uh, my, my, my best bench is 200 even. Uh, for a single? And uh, yeah, for no, yeah, I think that was for a single. Um, and again, I was trying something because I was, I think I was working at it at about uh, 180, 185, something like that, uh, doing doing reps. But uh, then um, uh, press uh, 140. Be as detailed as you'd like. I want to know, I want to know everything because for me, starting strength has changed my. Yeah, I've, I've said this before, but I, I wouldn't be with my wife, which means I wouldn't be here in Idaho. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have my daughter. Um, I wouldn't have my job. Uh, I probably never would have competed in a fight, which has been a lifelong goal of mine. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, just, just everything about my presence, my capability, my day-to-day -day interaction with others and my environment, everything has radically changed for the mm -hmm. better, which is why I'm doing things like this podcast to try to, to tell other people about this. Um, what, what All has right. been your experience? Uh, well, the, I think the first thing is that, you know, what does that do to a person to, to make that transformation? I, I don't know what I wouldn't have right now. Like, I think you have some pretty clear cut ideas of, of those things, but, uh, my, my outlook on sort of my place in the world, my, my out, how I move through my day, how I interact with, with, with other people. Um, all of that has changed significantly um, because of the confidence and the, I don't know, heck the, the vigor and the, as we old folks say, the pep uh, of, of knowing what you can do, you know, when, when you've got, you know, 400 and X pounds on your back. And that fourth rep was a kind of a grinder and you don't rack it. You go down and you, and you come back up out of the, you know, out of the bottom on the next rep and you make it. Mm. And then you do that the next week as well. Mm. You teach, you, you teach yourself things about you that, um, that just extend so far beyond anything that has to do with athletics or, or exercise or lifting or anything. Uh, so, and then like I, like I mentioned before, you know, I'll, I'll pass a mirror today and it's startling to see that that's the guy. Cause I lived 54 years, probably 55 years of my life knowing a completely different, you know, guy in the mirror. Yeah. And suddenly I, I look like, you know, Someone that maybe you know I I aspired to be when I was a young man and yeah. it just it never worked out because I never put in the work. Right. And boom, in a couple of years, um, I've I've got that in. I don't have any physical limitations. I, it's not like I was, you know, had a cane before or, or had trouble going upstairs or whatever. But like, uh, I haven't changed my activity level from my twenties. Mm. Um, and I expected that once you hit, you know, your mid fifties, everything starts to decline a little bit. Hmm. It hasn't declined at all. It's gotten better. Nice. So, so better than twenties or better than it's been recently? Oh, well, I mean, 
better no better than 20s um just i don't know i'm 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 super active <laughs> uh i don't like to sit for long uh, periods of time uh like talking to you here for a while is going to be a chore because i can't get up and and go do something um <laughs> it's that 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 level of energy uh so but anything that i could do in my 20s i can do now and i don't know if 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 I could, you know, do that, um, if I hadn't started this. Mm. Compare for me the fifth rep on a heavy set with the, uh, the mental fortitude required to do long distance cycling. And I'm assuming by the mm. way that you're doing, uh, that you're doing intense cycling mm. and you're, you're pushing it. Um, so, so yeah, well, fill, fill me in on that. What kind of, what style sure. you, uh, you pursued and how that compares. Right. Well, to start, I'm going to, I'm going to say I'm, I'm no longer a road cyclist. Mm -hmm. Now I did that for a few years. Uh, I don't think maybe I could, I don't know if I could do that and do what I'm doing now. Cause I was putting in 10, 12 hours a week on mm -hmm. the bike, mm -hmm. um, a couple hundred miles. And some of the, the, the really, the workout where some of the rides are, are just easy, you know, but, uh, some of the, the serious work and, and, and hill climbing and stuff like that, there is that like a hill climb for instance you you can't stop you don't stop on a, on a ride you you keep moving the pedals um and you can't stop on a climb it you know you could stop at the top of you but you can't stop you know up on a climb it just it it shouldn't enter your mind you know it it, it, it sucks in fact there's a lot about cycling that's it's suffering it's there's a lot of suffering the, the pro cyclist mention that sometimes, but, uh, and, and they suffer worse than, than any of us amateurs, but, uh, it's suffering, but you get used to suffering, but I don't know when, so when you got, you know, the heavy barbell on your back, you have to, first of all, decide that you're not going to rack it, mm. which, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't really know how this compares to, to, to cycling. Um, but I mean, both are tough. But you have to decide it's it's a willful act not to rack it and then it's a willful act to start that descent and to hit depth and then to not stop you know because if the if the if the last rep was uh was tough you're going to hit a little sticking point mm. um and so i mean i think all of us we have to sort of develop a way to get past that like create a personal rule I'm going to give it X seconds. I'm, if I keep moving, I'm going to keep pushing or whatever it is. That is the thing that gets you through that. But what matters is that you start that. Now you can either get through it or you can't, because I've laid the bar down several times mm. on the pins, but uh, you can either get through that or, or, or you can't. But, you know, most times I think for me, at least I do. But uh, if I racked it, I wouldn't like myself much the rest of that day. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, one bout of suffering and putting your pride on the line compared to continuous suffering, but lower intensity on, on the road. Is that an accurate way to summarize it? Sure. And it's all repeated because, you know, if, if I'm on a long, you know, like an 80 mile ride or whatever, there's going to be, you know, hard parts and easier parts. And I'm going to choose to get to those hard parts that are still, you know, an hour and a half away. Mm. But same thing with, with lifting, you know, if, if this, if your squat sets were, you know, were super tough, you've got deadlift waiting for you. Mm. And then you've got two days later, you've got, you know, the same thing. Mm -hmm. This is going to happen again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to decide, I'm not going to miss that workout. You just, you just do it because it's what it's like brushing, brushing your teeth. Right. Yeah, I look at it the same way, and I try to encourage my trainees and friends and family to do that as well. Um, lifting weights is part of my job. I will go to the yeah. gym in the middle of a work day and uh, ignore phone calls and get my work done because it has to get done. It is non-optional. Not only is it part Ooh. of my job, <clears throat> but it is fundamental to my, to my health and my enjoyment of life. And so I don't skip training. I don't skip training. I don't think I missed a single session even when the baby was born because I've been on the other side of it and I don't want to get That's there. Tough. And you start making compromises and you start making yeah. excuses and you start pushing stuff off 
and then all of a sudden you're missing workouts and then you're hurting more and you're getting weaker and you're declining mm-hmm. and uh and then lifting isn't part of your schedule so i'm i feel the same way about mm-hmm. it 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 is just like anything else that must happen in my life i must eat i must sleep mm-hmm. i must lift you know it's a, it's non-negotiable something you mentioned during the intro of the podcast was that you uh you thought that lifting was something that you should do can you can you expand on that yeah. what what led you to that conclusion oh in my mind, it was a thing that did what nothing else could. Nothing builds a strong body except lifting. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to have good cardio if I was weak. Mm. And especially, I mean, the thing, again, the, you know, I, I talked to you about looking at myself in the mirror and seeing that bean pole with a pot, you know, a little pot that was starting to form. <clears throat> it was a complete lack of an upper body i mean where the i had the where there are no shoulders they're just flat things that go into these little you know spaghetti noodle arms and i've always found that unappealing and as i got older i I would notice it in other people and i'd be like oh crap (laughs) that's me and that was disheartening and it was uh uh disgusting but i mean but but the main thing was as I go into the latter half of my life, I didn't want to, again, have good cardio or, you know, be fit. I wanted to be strong. Mm. And the only thing that gets you strong is lifting heavy weights. Mm. And I mean, I'm, I don't know if I'm like a lot of people, but I spent a lot of time online, listening to various experts talk about, you know, what you need to do in life, you know, uh, to, to stay strong. And they all involved weight, but, Again, there was that pink man that was talking about, yeah, and most of that is BS. It's only when you lift heavyweight, increasingly heavyweight, mm-hmm. uh, and you do it at least, you know, three days a week, and you keep adding five pounds. You keep adding five pounds. Like, okay, I, that makes, you know, some sense, but that seems a little excessive. But mm. uh, uh, I just started. But, yeah, lifting, that, that was the only thing that was going to make me strong. On one hand, it seems simple and obvious. On the other hand, it does seem extreme and excessive. But you can't fuck with the argument. Rip's, Rip, no. Rip's arguments are bulletproof. I mean, I spent a good chunk of my life uh, pulling apart texts and trying to uh, find holes in arguments. That was uh, most of my childhood. And um, mm. you know, I, look, I looked at the Starting Strength book in a simil- similar context. I'm trying to find an error in his mm. thinking. And, yeah. and it's pretty damn bulletproof. And I've said this before, but that on its own is not enough to convince me because just because it sounds plausible doesn't mean it's true. Right. I'm the type that uh, I'm skeptical until I can verify it myself. Or if someone I trust, you know, to the degree that I trust my brother or like a Nick Delgadillo tells me something, then that's a, that's a high degree of, of belief as well. Um, but luckily, unlike many things in life, this is something you can actually take and apply to yourself and prove it to yourself. So this is, mm-hmm. this is science in the truest sense of the word. Ripito had a hypothesis. He developed a theory. He tested his theory in his lab in Wichita Falls over the course of decades. Mm-hmm. He then communicated his, his theory to his peers. And each of us are peer reviewing his theory. And millions of people mm-hmm. have peer reviewed the theory. And, uh, that's pretty right. fascinating. And so when yeah. we when we get into topics that are scientific in nature but not necessarily related to strength training, I believe we have the uh the credibility and the the rigor and the 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 background to do so just based on the fact that we are actually performing science here. Is it funded by the NIH and is it double blind placebo controlled? Well, that doesn't even make sense, but no. Is it, is it published in the, the New England Journal of Medicine? Well, no. Does that make it any less real? Absolutely not. Because as Ripito states, Mm-mm. it's the phenomenology. It's the phenomenology. An anecdote, mm-hmm. N equals one, is not data, but a series of anecdotes of N equals a million that all you know, indicate things like a guy in his 50s going from 175 pound to 230 pound body weight and developing a 440 pound squat 
th- there's causation there. <laughs> So for, yeah. <laughs> for, for a guy like me that is extremely skeptical and has a very high bar of, uh, of you know, quantifying something in my brain as factually correct, this is one of the few things that is true. And I talked to Ina Koppel about this a lot. This is uh, one of her favorite aspects of the program. There's so much bullshit in yeah. life. My God, especially yeah. in 2023. Yeah. So many narratives, so much nonsense, so much pressure, so much belief. Um and not to shit on belief in things that you can't prove, but for those of us that appreciate things that are quantifiable and repeatable, this is this is it. Mm-hmm. And and when you get when you dig into it, like you've done, like you know, a lot of folks in the starting strength world have done, you f- it's still mind boggling to me the the amount of supporting investigation and and testing and results that are documented even in the book like the first the book that i bought was the barbell prescription and that book starts out uh one of the first chapters is the the sick aging phenotype talking about essentially the the pathology for probably most americans i think and working in the in the medical field i hear about it every day the sort of the specifics of of this stuff and how that informs this process and and uh, sort of compels this process and that's just one aspect the, the sort of the sort of scientific approach to one particular aspect of um of human health and how other things affect it and don't affect it that's the other thing you know the 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 pains that that rip and others have taken to to dispel some of the horrible conventions that people hold on to related to health not not strength necessarily but health in general and it's all supporting material for this program mm-hmm. that is about making stronger you know harder to kill human beings yep that's you got to respect that you got to respect that and you got to be a little bit concerned that it took a power lifter from texas to be the one to come up with this this uh insider innovation whatever you want to call it I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed of humanity for not having developed this simple, <laughs> straightforward stress recovery adaptation approach to human physiology mm-hmm. um, until Ripito decided to, to write it down. And it existed, but it was tribal knowledge and it was super niche. I'm talking mm-hmm. about at scale. I'm talking about, mm-hmm. you know, why does your MD not understand this? This is probably the, if not the most, one of the most fundamental yeah. aspects of health and mm-hmm. your existence on earth. And this guy's going to talk to you all day about lisinopril and uh, and a statin, but he's not going to talk yep. to you about linear progression. And um, I don't know if he ever will, especially since yeah. our medical system is so badly corrupted. But I'm glad that we have the insight, and whether we have to to take the uh, underground approach to find it and to attain it, or the above board, um, you know, endorsed by the mainstream approach, it doesn't matter. What matters is what works. It is. And because it works, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I don't understand why medicine, even one specific discipline of medicine, doesn't uh, isn't devoted to this in some way. Doesn't doesn't know this at all. Uh, I mean, I get from the barbell sports sort of uh, culture uh, that. A lot of folks would avoid this because it's hard um, and it it takes a kind of curiosity that extends beyond making money on, you know, getting people to do your program or whatever. Um, but medicine, I it's unforgivable. In fact, I mean, I, I don't know if exp- I've exp- I may have expressed to you, but I, I have contempt for all of uh, at least American medicine. I assume that it's representative of world medicine. Because it's it's quackery it really and it's dangerous. Most of it is dangerous. A lot of it is. I don't know what the percentage uh, is, but a lot of it is certainly dangerous. Um, it killed it till, killed killed both my grandparents last month. Oh man! Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Goodness, they're ready to go. And that's yeah. another shame of our system is that it, uh, you know, that it has it has people on polypharmacy and uh, um, yeah. just bleeding them of every one of their last dollars. 
with doctors, right. and procedures and, and medications right. and doing things that no one actually knows what the, what the net effect is of. Um, and so these, you yeah. know, my grandparents were suffering. So the, the good news is their suffering's over and our system yeah. doesn't have a, yeah. a, a way of allowing people to end their suffering. Um, whether, whether, whether it should or not is, is, a uh, is a complicated discussion, mm -hmm. but, um, sure. you know, the fact I won't go into the details, but, but, uh, my grandfather, his death was preventable based on actually both, both of my grandparents, their death was the root cause was prescription of a medication that they had a nasty side effect to. Ugh, oh um, man. So, um, and you know, I've, so I've, funny. I've had to save my mother from probably four different situations where a doctor was about to make a, a, a mistake with her health and not fully thought through a mistake oh, based on yeah. protocol. Um, yep. And I see it all the time. I now get to see how the sausage is made with uh, being an EMT. And mm -hmm. I had James Johnson on the podcast, the Salt Lake City guy, mm -hmm. the, and the franchise owner from Salt Lake City. And he, um, you know, he's been in the healthcare field for a while, and he has had several of these uh, assisted living facilities. And I think his perspective mm -hmm. on it is is correct. He's a he's a positive guy. He's a religious guy. He's he's got a good yeah. good point of view. There's so many wonderful people trying to do great things in the field, and that should not be discounted. But the fact of the matter is the bureaucracy has taken over. There's no accountability. Mm, yeah. There's no skin in the game. The incentives oh. are shit. And the way decisions may are made are for political purposes and not for yes. health outcomes. And that is, that yes. is the, the actual state of affairs. Whether you recognize it or not, that is the actual state of affairs. I don't say all this just to shit it on. It didn't the system, start out that way, but no, it didn't start out that way. And and, and but but I but I do right. say this because I want to reinforce a point that I think is really important. When it comes to your own health, it's your responsibility. When I was growing up, yeah, and I think this is why Absolutely. my grandparents are dead, um, is because I was taught that um, you can have faith in the system. Doctor knows best, and um, I think what's happened here, if I had to speculate, is that. The profiteers who only care about cash, regardless of negative consequences about to others, which is the definition of evil in my opinion, have found that the there's no better way to sell something than via the priest, via the, the person that someone goes to with full yeah. trust and belief, which is what medical yeah. professionals <clears throat> became over the last several decades. And um, that trust has been, it's been weaponized M much the much in the way yeah, that, that empathy is weaponized in politics right mm -hmm. like you can be some some 20 year old berkeley student and like yeah black lives matter well no shit black lives matter i don't you don't you don't understand mm -hmm. what you're saying though you're supporting a marxist right. organization but they're weaponizing that person's mm -hmm. compassion and this is uh yep. I, won't, I won't go out off too far on a tangent here but this is uh this is why we can't be trusted um as a collective because we're we make emotional decisions yeah. and we are too easy to manipulate but but the the whole point of that rant is i just want to encourage everyone who's listening or watching to please take control of your own health care you treat medical professionals and any service provider in your life as a consultant you don't have blind faith in people just because they have a credential um, and if you if you do fall victim to that, there mm -hmm. are consequences. So just I'd like to caution yeah. everyone against that. Yeah, and that's what, and part of what I think the sort of medicinal approach to, well, it's medicine, is to essentially lock you in. It's the same as the the pusher on the street. It's to get you in so they can get the hooks in, so that you are your your next the next solution to your next problem is going to be another one. Yep. And you're going to need a combination, and this combination is bad. So we're going to put you on that combination, and it, and 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 it doesn't become looking at your life holistically. It becomes, well, okay, well, what uh, what drug will work? Yep. How about no drugs? Yeah, yeah. I don't How take about any. We find a solution. I take drugs. no drugs. Yeah, yeah. And I hope that that lasts. But uh, yeah. And if anyone if anyone is calling bullshit on my claims here, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Okay. If if anyone can find a medically sound, scientifically backed reason to treat a late stage COVID patient with remdesivir, which was a standard CDC approved protocol, 
yeah. even after the studies indicated how dangerous it was. If anyone can tell me right. why, how that makes sense, I will send you $100 and I'll invite you on the podcast for a conversation. And, and I, could, I, could, I could name 20 examples just like that to, to just yeah. completely demonstrate the degree of medical corruption. But before I get all pissed so off and ruin my day, Andy, let's go back to fun stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so this was a dark sequence in our <laughs> chat. <here. laughs> um, we we were talking about the numerical nature of this program and uh, mm -hmm. the scientific aspect to it, and real science, not scientism, where it's you know belief in people that perform science, and mm -hmm. therefore you're just part of mm -hmm. a new religion. Um, within that, Andy we have developed a digital logbook that we have since shown to you and you've become aware of and you are now involved with mm -hmm. and working on. Um, tell me in, in your words, the significance of this yeah. data firstly, and then also I'd like to hear yeah. a summary of, uh, of what you've done to the logbook, the, the little changes we're working on to kind of make it more engaging and, and a little more rewarding. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because maybe there is such a thing, but I, I have to wonder if there's any other kind of application out there that is gathering this scope of information, this daily scope of information that is directly tied to a prescription of, uh, you know, a, a training program, essentially, um, that is documenting the results. And so, I mean, I have to, uh, I don't have any insight into this. I have to believe that that's, that's really powerful to examine because this uh, that's what I understand starting strength continually does is re-examines, you know, the techniques and claims and, and whatever else, you know, is it still working? Did it ever work? You know, whatever, uh, to, to adapt it, to change it. And, and there has been change, uh, introduced in starting strength, I think from the beginning, um, as things evolve, as knowledge evolves. And so I have to think that that's a really powerful, um, tool. And I'm excited. I don't, like I said, I don't have great insight into it, but I, I'm excited about what's going to be done with that. Uh, but there are some things that, uh, that, you know, you and I have worked on and that is essentially giving a lot of the, the students insight into what they've accomplished. Um, one of the things that we've been working on is, is giving some kudos when you uh, reach a certain milestone whether that's a plate milestone or a PR or, or whatever. Uh, so that's about your workout, you know, uh, when, when, you know, when the individual is, has been on the program for X months or X years or whatever. So, uh, and then looking back at how those milestones occur, when they occurred and, you know, at, at what tempo or whatever. Um, but of course, the, the, again, the interesting thing about that from the students, from, you know, the trainees uh, perspective is, you know, you made that happen. And if you started missing workouts or whatever, it slowed down. Mm -hmm. There's no way to cheat the system. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's clear insight into that as well. I mean, you you, you kind of see that every day if you're still, if you still only have one plate and, you know, uh, and then some little ones on there doing this one movement and it's been six months, that's probably on you. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's on you about that. So uh, you can, you can forge your own PRs. But um, uh, one funny, one, I saw you. Saw, I don't know if you saw. I kind of chuckled when you started mentioning this app. Uh, I didn't get in trouble, but it was. I was startled when my coach uh, hit me up and he said, "So you um, you pulled four forty yesterday?" <laughs> I was like, "What?" And I was putting dummy data into the app so that I could get you know <laughs> screenshots and so I could learn how to use the app. And I left it and he sent me a photograph of, from the gym, uh, on the standings. And I was at the top. <laughs> it, uh, oh, yeah. Cause you're, you're like, technically a member of starting strength, Katie, aren't you? Uh, uh, Plano. Oh, is it Plano? Okay. Yeah. My bad. I thought yeah, you were Plano. in the Houston area. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you and I have talked about Katie. So uh, oh, okay. anyway. that's what it is. But, uh, yeah. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And so I had to remove that. Now that you know your PRs are going to show up on the screen in the gym, maybe you should enter your workouts in there anyways, huh? And, you know, I was thinking of that. I just, I didn't know if that was cheating or whatever, or, you know, uh, uh, t taking uh, gym privilege, or whatever. But uh, if you're paying them but, for membership, uh, you get access to the logbook and you get to yeah. use it if you want to. So, yeah. yeah.
No, but another, I think, nice thing that I think we've talked about is uh, uh, being able to sort of see where you sit. For mm. people who are your age, your sex, um, where do you fit in the world of, mm. uh, of you know, PRs or whatever, mm. uh, or the, the, the rate at which you, you got to this particular milestone? Um, again, that's, that's interesting stuff. And I think anything that helps fuel the enthusiasm of, of the folks who are doing this is, is a good thing. And, you know, maybe that's, that's part of it, but the fact that you're able to do that is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And just so everyone's aware of the context here, basically what this means is we have a custom application that we built for starting strength gyms and it's a web app. You don't have to remember your iTunes password to download an app and take up storage on your phone. Just go to a bookmark that you shortcut on your iPhone or your Android. Brings you to a digital logbook that was uh, designed initially by Keith Barney, the guy that did the intro music to this podcast, if you're watching it on YouTube. Um, really talented designer. And uh, he just made this really simple digital logbook interface where you track all your workouts. And then a bunch of stuff happens once you do that. So first of all, it's stored in a database. So we can see how much progress people make over time on average, median, min, max. We can slice and dice it any way we'd like to. And then in addition to that, it shoots your information up on the screen. So there's two screens in the gym when you walk in. One is the schedule. And so the it, it shows everybody who's joining the next session and what they will be lifting that day. So you walk in, your name's on the board and your lifts are on the board. You go over to your rack, you write down your lifts and your warmups and then you're good to go. And then on the other screen, it lifts, it lists all of the PRs for the gym. And then the screen rotates and it lists all of the PRs in order for the whole franchise. The dashboard will show that to, it won't just show the top eight or whatever it is we show. You'll be able to go from one to, to end. You'll be able to see every single person stack right in the gym. You'll be able to filter by how often they train, how long they've been training, filter by gym, filter by sex, filter by lift. Um, you'll be able to uh, compare gyms to each other. You'll be able to compare progress over time. Um, and then the last thing that we have planned for this data at the moment, well, it's not the last thing. We're, we're also doing a study with the University of Chicago. Uh, there's a guy in Texas who's at a satellite branch of the university who got some grant funds that he wants to use to play with this data and, and see how strength affects health outcomes and a bunch of other stuff. You can argue with me all you want, um, but if I show you case study video after case study video of anecdotal qualitative results with a quantitative flair, you can't argue much with that. <clears throat> if I can layer on top no. a data set of thousands of people that have done this program and the uh, indisputable results they've achieved based on the weight on the bar, yeah. I, I try to fuck with that. I'm, I'm trying to think of all the other uh, programs or, you know, um, internet stars that are going to jump right on that and be able to offer the same kind of info to folks. It's, it's not going to happen. <laughs> well, and I, I really, I've, I say this a lot, but I really am waiting for a competitor. The sooner you guys can come, the better. The sooner you can come, the better. Yeah. We just got hit Heck up yeah. by a, um, a company whose job it is to take promising young franchisors and layer on their capability and to grow them and sell them to private equity for a hundred million dollars. This is their, this is their thing. And, uh, the, the guy from that company got in touch with me, they're out of Chicago and we had a conversation and he, he was ready to go and he's interested, but I told him that I wasn't taking the call because I'm open to that idea. I was taking the yeah. call to see if he thought our idea was as wonderful as I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, he, and he does. And, and I also told him I'm willing to help him out because awesome. I've got a buddy that runs a, a franchise company that, uh, yeah. that is looking for an exit. Uh -huh. We are not looking for an exit. That is not our goal. Okay. Uh, but That's what I figured you were going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but I cannot wait. I cannot wait for someone to come out with uh, mainstream strength, you know, whatever, whatever the name ends up being. Um, it's probably not going to be as pure as our offering, but I, I hope, I hope someone does just barbells and squat racks and I hope they have a lot of money behind them because they are going to, um, undercut us on price and they are going to pay their coaches less and they're still going to make a lot of people better. They're still going to have a, a net positive yeah. impact, but the most important sure. thing they're going to do is they're going to bring a whole bunch of attention to this category. 
And then when people, um, yep. let's say you've never heard of, uh, of Porsche and you're just getting into cars and, yep. um, and you see a Chrysler, you're like, oh, that Chrysler's kind of cool looking. And you're like, oh, looking at the, the engineering shit. Um, oh, the maintenance is terrible. Um, the safety's awful. I don't want anything to do with this. What else is out there? Oh shit, there's Porsche. Um, so we're, we're always going to be premium. <laughs> we're always going to be the better experience. We're always going to yep. be the, uh, yeah. high quality people, the engineering rigor. And, yep. um, the sooner we get a competitor, the better, because we're not going to go downstream ourselves. Someone else is going to have Thank to you. do it. And it's just going to help a lot of people mm -hmm. get stronger and maybe in not as good of a way as what we do, but bring a whole lot of attention to the category and help us grow. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, competition is awesome. And, you know, I, I've met, you know, a lot of the folks on your team. And if you think you're being creative right now, because I mean, you guys are a creative uppity bunch, but if you think you're that creative and uppity right now, wait till you have a real competitor. Yeah. It's just, that's fantastic. Yep. What, what's your impression of the team so far? Feel free to say anything positive or negative. Cause I always talk, talk, uh, <laughs> I say nothing but great things about our group. I might be slightly yeah. biased and, and have the rose tinted glasses on, but I've, I've said this before, this yeah. team is the best team I've ever worked with in my entire career, including the time when I literally had an unlimited budget and I could import anyone from anywhere in the world to come work with us. Mm. This team out executes those people hands down. Yeah. And I hand selected <clears throat> these people too. It's just, and the difference by the way is yeah. uh, first principles thinking, the ability to do an analysis and passion yeah. and buy-in. These are not mercenaries that, I'm, that are hired guns to get right. a job done. These are people that would literally do this for free if they could. You know, our, our right. CFO well, is not making what he could make with a bigger client. He's making the amount of money yeah. he thinks we can afford based on our current stage, and he's happy to help and spend his time making less money because he thinks what we're doing is so important. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Austin, mm -hmm. by the way, if you're listening. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, that's the impression I get, and, and I think for good reason. I mean, uh, this is an – from. From what I've gathered you know, from the few touches that I've had, this is an energetic, passionate bunch of people who, well, I'm making some assumptions here, but but I, but I have some insight. And I believe that you guys are kind of flying by the seat of your pants and you're having to make consequential decisions every week about that, that are going to you know, have you know a lot of impact on what you're trying to do. And but everyone kind of has the right idea about what you're trying the the same idea the right idea as far as i can tell about what you're trying to do and that kind of energy is just it's infectious and i think one of the reasons that that you dig this team over when you were said you had unlimited budget and unlimited whatever constraint is the key to excellence <laughs> when there are no constraints anything is possible and therefore absolutely nothing of consequence can get done mm -hmm constraint is how you get great shit done mm. is and in fact the more constraint the better and well, so you guys are constrained. under all kinds of constraints <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <shit>. yeah. <laughs> so embrace that love that yeah. and and make that you know uh you know uh, that's a love letter to your results any idea if you had to guess what it cost to build this company what the outlay was oh goodness Oh, I don't know that I I can't I can't have a good concept of that. Uh, I I uh, I I would just be spouting nonsense. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I uh, I mentioned this to Nick the other day, and I I truly believe I worked for for BlackBerry, right? And that that company will be yeah. a discussion, a case study discussion in business schools until the end of time, because of uh, the rapid growth and the rapid decline, the silly CEO structure. They have two CEOs on yeah. kind of shit. Um, yeah. We somehow managed to build this company for $500,000. $500,000. Wow. Um, wow. As that's not, ridiculous. That's not actually a, a, a fair indication because that includes the person running it working for free for probably four years. Um, oh, yeah. But we are a hodgepodge team of mm. part-timers that put in as much effort as we can to get as much work as possible done as quickly as possible yeah. to the highest degree of quality. And it's an interesting point that you said about constraints, because those constraints, although they took years off my life, did uh, help us produce some pretty phenomenal work. Um, yeah. Man, I wish we had more money along the way, because we, uh, 
I had to make difficult oh, decisions um, and, and, you know, furlough people in some mm -hmm. situations. Uh, COVID was, was, was frightening in a number of ways, not, not because of the virus, because mm -hmm. of the government's response. Um, but yeah, man, yes. here we are, here we are, we got it done. And, uh, you know, we are flying by the seat of our pants in the sense that we don't necessarily know what the tactics are, but we know what our objective is. We know what the strategy is. And mm -hmm. as far as figuring out how to get the strategy accomplished to achieve the objective, that's where the, the fun energetic part comes in. And we've got just on this marketing team that you're a part of now, you know, we essentially built an internal agency because we couldn't hire anyone that was worth a shit. Um, nor could any right. marketing agency truly do this thing justice better than we can. So we just kind of hired an internal agency and here we are. And, you know, we're on that weekly call that you've been a part of a couple of times. And, uh, we're talking about telling great stories and spreading the message yep. through our different offline and online channels. And, mm -hmm. um, it's a but everybody who's involved is up to here yeah. in, in what is great about this. Yeah. And that makes fantastic difference. Hell yeah. Yeah. Um, it's been good fun. I really like my job. I, I, I when I was trying to do I stuff like do. this and also running the company, I, I actually despise my job and I was pretty thoroughly burnt out and I was operating just purely on, uh, on a desire to not fail, but it was not fun. I, I very mm -hmm. unsatisfying work, just constantly dealing with problems yeah. and, uh, big programs I've wanted to roll out. I just, there just wasn't enough time or resources to get it done. So the fact that Luke runs the mm -hmm. show now, and I can focus mm -hmm. on bringing you products and services to market and communicating mm -hmm. our message more effectively, um, I think is, is great for everybody, but especially my sanity. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that is one, I think, uh, I don't know if it's an American dream, but one dream that I think a lot of folks has is to invent their own job, yep. the thing that they love and you've done it and you're doing it. And obviously other folks who are with you are, are doing that as well. So, uh, and I'm enjoying the heck out of, you know, the, well, what I get to do with you. So hand selecting a team times. and hand selecting what the team works on and hand selecting a boss in my case. Cause I do treat Luke like he's my boss. He's my client. Yeah. I'm his vendor, um, and hand selecting mm -hmm. your business partners and then deciding how your day flows and deciding what's important, deciding what you work on. That's uh, that's freedom. I don't make nearly, I, the, I make as much money now as I made when I was 21 years old, um, not adjusted for inflation. So this is okay. not the thing. This is not the Blackberry job where I was yeah. making 40 grand a month, but I'm more yeah. free than I was when I was making half a million dollars a year, which is interesting. Um, and if we are not greedy and we're patient, the money will come. And no one really right. is motivated by wanting a private plane at this company. We're motivated by right. doing things that we're proud of. And yeah, it would mm -hmm. be nice to be able to live a good lifestyle, not have to have too many worries about cash as a result of the value that we provide, which uh, I believe if we're mm -hmm. patient will come in three, five plus years. Right. That, that takes tremendous courage. I mean, ridiculous courage, especially when you're, you're starting a family, um, to, to decide that you're going to number one, give that whole, you know, what you just described, give that whole thing a go. And then to make those decisions, you, you were talking about deciding, you know, what you're going to work on, what you're going to put out, who you're going to hire, who you're, you, you hired your own boss that takes, you know, again, tremendous courage and, and to keep it going and to delay the full satisfaction. Obviously I think you and everyone involved is, is deriving a great deal of satisfaction from this, but, but to, to have an understanding that you're growing your own garden and there is going to be a harvest. Yep. Um, that's, and that's the, fantastic. I and mean, anyone would want to do that. Yeah. And one of the, one of the really interesting things about this is that our job, the purpose of this business is to enable other people to do the same. So we get to take a guy yeah. who's been in corporate yeah. land and is just, just, you know, having daydreams about a noose, um, cause he can't take the, the DEI social justice, uh, training. He just had to go through for the third yeah. time. And the TPS reports, his boss just came around and talked to him about in his cubicle and, uh, you know, the, the changing work from home policies and COVID Ooh. policies and working without a mission or a purpose, just working to, to earn a buck. And you get to take someone like this yeah. and, uh, 
and help them take a massive bet because in some cases these franchise owners are, are really betting the house, um, like literally putting their house on the line to, to open these mm -hmm. gyms. Yeah. And then um, guide them through the process in as low of a risk way as possible. By no means am I suggesting it's low risk. Entrepreneurship is high risk. But franchising, if you um, get with the right franchise company, the whole purpose is to reduce the risk because the, the mm -hmm. hypotheses have already been proven. That's the idea. So the fact that we get to enable other people to live better lives, not just because yep. of, of what we offer our service, but because uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> they can become their own boss, they can hire their own team, they can define their own work schedule, um, and they can, they can mm -hmm. fail or succeed based on their own level of commitment and uh, output. That's extraordinarily satisfying too. And then the people in our gyms sure. are a lot of people that are of that archetype already that, uh, that have put in hard work their whole lives, and that's why they can afford our expensive membership. It's not cheap to train at one of our gyms, as you know. Um, right. So then, and then what you get at the end of that is just a group of people, an extended group of people that is really like an extended family with a common values, uh, purpose, and mm -hmm. uh, and common results that we all understand and appreciate and applaud each other for. So it's just, mm -hmm. it's a really special thing that we have here. And, and uh, some people call us a cult yeah. and uh, that's fine. You know, you can it's use a community derogatory term you like, what, but we're having a good time. So well, what you, what you described <laughs> there is a community. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Andy, I wanted to ask you, we're going longer. Damn, I, oh, there's so much more I wanted to talk to you about. And we got we got carried away, but I'm, I'm glad we did because I enjoyed the topics we covered. But yeah, what, me too. Why don't, why don't we end on one last topic? Tell me, tell me when you decided to get an SSC and um, what you did from there and what it was like. Oh. Yeah, so um, as, as I described, I was making good progress. Uh, you know, lifts are going up, I'm putting on body weight. Um, and I'm liking, um, the results I like, I'm putting on body weight, but I'm not getting fat. You know, I'm like starting to, the whole body composition is just changing, uh, and everything's going good, but I ran out my, um, my linear, uh, novice progression and I didn't quite know what to do. And so, you know, referring back to the barbell prescription, I'm looking at programming or whatever, and I'm trying to do this on my own. Uh, cause I'm, you know, I'm working out here at my own, in my garage, um, and settled on the Texas method. Uh, even though folks, a lot of folks said, even in the book says, you know, this is really hard for, you know, someone who's in their fifties or sixties or whatever. And, but I just, I took it up and started doing that and was continued to make progress. And then the intensity started making recovery a bit of a problem. So I started modifying the number of sets or yeah, the number of sets and I eliminated a squat day and, and whatever. And so pretty soon I was doing, you know, Mick, you know, Joe's ridiculous made up workout. <laughs> and, so and, and it was experimental. To me, I have no you, idea. Yeah. Cause you didn't have the, the basis of knowledge to understand whether or not that would be effective. Right. Right. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm doing what I thought was, you know, the smart thing to do. I'm paying attention to the videos and I'm reading, you know, the books and I'm reading the articles and I'm getting good nuggets out of that, but it's still not allowing me to know with any sort of, a, you know, authority that when I make this change, this is what I can expect. I had no idea. And so I got to the point where, you know, this is serious. This is an important part of my life. I don't want to mess this up. I sure don't, at my age, I don't want to start, you know, injuring myself. I need a pro to help me with this. And so uh, I, because of how my life is structured, go, going to a gym three days a week is going to, was going to be really tough for me. Um, I'm busy. I got a lot of things going on and, but I have this time in the early wee hours of the morning where I can do anything. And I chose to lift three days a week. Hmm. Um, and so the online coaching seemed like a really good thing to try. And so I, you know, I, when I made the leap and got in touch, was it Rebecca, maybe Skinner um, yeah. had a conversation. Yeah. Rebecca Skinner had a conversation, which was awesome. Uh, and again, I like how you did that. Like, you know, what are your goals? What are your fears? What are, you know, uh, what are you trying to do? Um, you're, you're asking the right questions, just like in, in, in form, on an online forum. And then there was the the actual conversation, which got a lot more detailed. Um, and in fact, when I sent in my forum, I said, I've been watching your podcast and I said, you know, uh, 
I, I think I would like to have Ray Gillenwater be my coach. Oh, that In was fact, you. I might insist on that. I remember this. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, do you? Yeah, yeah. Rebecca and hit me up. The reason. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the reason for that was because uh, I, you had mentioned that you had some shoulder problems or whatever, and yeah. you had work. You'd find your ways to work through that or whatever. It's like, yeah, he gets me because I, I had uh, I I destroyed my right rotator cuff, um, and I'm not going to have surgery on it. And so I'm, you know, I'm having to feel my way through that. I thought you would be the best guy for that. Anyway, and she said, you know, Ray's not taking on any clients, uh, but, you know, we're going to find you somebody, you know, that is going to be great. And I was like, yeah, sure, fine. Because again, being an SSC, as I've come to learn, again, consuming as much content as I can, that's a consequential thing. Mm. There is a lot that goes into it. And every one of you guys and girls are fantastic at what you do. And you're continually training, you're continually research, uh, um, learning, exploring, you know, w what it is you need to learn because you guys work with, a, you know, everybody from, I think I've heard kids as young as 10 and people, you know, beyond 90. 97, 98. And yeah. Every one of those. Yeah. And so every one of those age groups has own little picadillos that, you know, you kind of got to bring to it. You got to know, you got to be authoritative uh, to that. So again, I... I was fine with it. I got a fantastic coach. I'm glad that you brought this up because I wanted to mention my coach, Michael Jones. Mm. Um, he was on the podcast. And, uh, I'll link to that episode. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I saw that. So uh, so that has been a great relationship and a great process. And of course, because I wasn't you know, technically perfect on everything, we kind of had to circle back and, and rebuild a foundation there. And that has been fun. Um, and, and frustrating, but you know, in the way that's like, dang it, is the squat still not right? What Never is. Do it? It's uh, impossible. No such thing. Uh, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, you know, everything's getting dialed in and, uh, you know, the weight is going back up. Everything's going in the right direction. And nice. when I, and I've, I've come across, uh, some little back tweaks and whatever, um, and, you know, plowed right through that. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael being there to remind me, okay, yeah, I, I know you hurt, but you're not injured. Mm -hmm. Let's put the weight on the bar and let's continue. Okay. And it works. Good job. Michael. So hell yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you shared that story, Michael. I'm a big fan of that guy. I didn't know him well at all. Then I had that conversation with him. Like, holy shit, you are, yeah. you are such a perfect fit for this job. And, um, yeah, he's awesome to, to end the podcast and to end, end the thought that I was sharing earlier about just kind of the big picture and the people and the incentives and trying what we're trying to build here. The, the coach part of it is, is actually the most important part, um, because the coaches are the ones delivering the service. You know, some businesses argue that their customers, the right. members are the most important part. It's actually not, it's, it's the people that are interfacing with those people. Mm -hmm. um, or you could argue that they are, but the only way that you make them as happy and fulfilled as you want them to be is via the mm -hmm. interface, which are the people that, that your business or businesses employ. And so prior mm -hmm. to the franchise company, there was not a gym that an SSC could go to where they had a job opportunity. There was no job for an SSC at a gym. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean for people that want to just do starting strength and don't want to do sales right. and don't want to work at 24 hour fitness right. and, and don't want to have to argue to try to get people yeah. to do it their way. And, and instead of trying to convince people that starting strength is the answer, um, people are coming to them wanting starting strength so they can just hone their craft. They can just do the thing that they know is the mm -hmm. most effective and they can just right. focus their productive time on doing that. I mean, that's like, you know, you come from the design world, you dealt with engineers and things. Imagine if, if, uh, if there was a particular domain of design, let's call it UX design. Um, and there were no yeah. UX design. Yeah, there were, there were no, and by the way, thanks for the compliments about your experience with us from a UX designer that, that, uh, that means a lot. Um, <laughs> but, but, but imagine yeah. if there were no, if you were a UX designer, that's all you wanted to do. And there were no jobs for UX design. And so if you wanted to be a UX designer, you had to start your own consultancy or you had to wedge yourself yep. into some other product or design job and then try to do as much UX design as you possibly could. That was the state of affairs mm -hmm. for people that wanted to coach starting strength for a living before the franchise company. Yeah. So 
I mean, I, I don't even know how many jobs we've created and how many people we've helped in that sense. But every time I talk to a coach on the podcast, I feel uh, a <laughs> tremendous sense of, um, I, I, it sounds, sounds like an odd word, but almost like peace, like, um, like it's it's well, very it's yeah. very settling and satisfying to know that that we've uh, we've helped people pursue what they want to do for a living. I could talk to you all day, and I love talking to you, by the way. So thanks for coming on the show. Every time we have a conversation, I'm right energized back at you. And, and fired up. So thank you, man. And um, yeah, if you, you if you leave this episode thinking, damn, there's a bunch of other stuff I wanted to mention, then uh, let's schedule another one because I enjoyed this very much. <laughs> well, then let's do it. Sure. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I'm, I, I think there's five or six topics that we could just, you know, wax poetic on. So, yeah. Indeed. And uh, for those of you that are gun fans, Andy, you should look up Andy. He's got, he's a, he's a gun aficionado and likes his shooting. So um, yeah, Andy, we'll leave it there, man. Thanks again for your time and make sure you send Bree some footage from your home garage and uh, home garage gym and, and putting up PRs and any design <laughs> re or copy related stuff you're doing for us that you want to highlight. Yeah, okay. will do. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Yeah. It's been great.